Anybody glad to be in church today? Come on, let's put those hands together.
There's beauty for ashes And there's joy to be found Oh, there is hope Here in His presence Yes, there is peace Here in this place For He is with us Come on And His name is Jesus And He's turning the city To a city Oh, come to the table He knows you by name There's no condemnation No judgment or shame His arms are wide open I've got me Come on. Hey, knuckle bump those around you before you grab a seat. Make sure you say hello to everyone. Come on. Welcome, everybody. How many are glad you showed up for church? Come on. Hey, it is the week of the Super Bowl. Come on, this town's getting ready to get crazy. Right here in Vegas, so glad that we get to host such an incredible event. I'm glad we get to host you being a part of Central. So give yourselves a hand for showing up this weekend. Hey, I wanna give a huge shout out to all of our first time guests. Help me welcome them, will you? You're in a place where it's okay to not be okay. Just sit back and relax. We're so thankful you're here. 
Hey, if you got a moment right after our experience, drop off to a place called New to Central. We wanna say hi and give you a gift from our family to yours. Also, make sure you download the Central Church app, turn on notifications to keep up with all that Central has to offer you and your family. And you know, one of the things you'll find on that app and on our website is how to step in and make a difference through an event called the Super Bowl of Caring, S-O-U-P-E-R, soup, because a can of soup or a single dollar can make a difference in someone's life who's experiencing hunger. And speaking of hunger, our Hope for the City partner uh, just received best nonprofit by a national organization called Tackle Hunger. Yes, we're thrilled at that nomination and selection and they're partnered with us to that event coming up on Wednesday along with Sports Philanthropy. They'll also be sponsoring that. They're gonna be VIPs and celebrities, athletes, and the city of Las Vegas and Central all showing up for a great cause. So come out and celebrate all that God's done. You need a ticket, you go to central.family to get that ticket and all the proceeds goes to support food relief in the Las Vegas Valley. So thank you for showing up and making an impact in that way. Well, you know, life change is a big deal. We pray every person at Central would experience a deep relationship with Jesus and follow him with all their heart, just like God has done in Eugene's life. Check it out. All right, I mean, I guess there's three major parts, right? There's the before, there's the when I accepted Christ, and then there's the after. So before I just kind of was like just doing life. I mean, you know, I was kind of young and just doing life and everything. And I came to Christ late in my life. But, um, you know, I came to a friend. He invited me to Central during a Christmas program in 1994. It was the small Central back then. And uh, went there, enjoyed the Christmas program, did some things. A few months after that, um, I had an opportunity to commit my life to Christ. And all the while I was like, well, I don't know when, I don't know if this time is right and all those kind of things. Because, you know, I was curious, but yet uncertain, just like a lot of people and so I decided well I think it's time so I committed to uh, f uh, accept Christ into my life August 2nd 1995 but if you back up a little bit it's kind of cool um, you know I had some relationships and actually had a little girl who was born and supposedly she was my daughter well the morning of my baptism I was called by the attorney and the paternity test showed that and this was a test that I took three months earlier and he said that my daughter was indeed my daughter. So the morning of my baptism, I found out that was my daughter. And I was like, man, he's just showing off now, man. My heavenly father's just showing off. So I knew August 2nd, 1995 was a, a life change event for me on a multiple number of facets. You know, I wish, I wish I could say it was just magical and there was like a light switch and everything just happened and I got the great, great job and you know, no more pain, no more hardships and all that, but it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that at all. But I think through it all, when I look back on it, God actually, he changed my perspective, not my circumstances. And therein lies the miracle of it all. You know, it's kind of cool. It's like, man, you don't have to get all these things that you think you need. You just need God in your heart. So it was like kind of cool. And so I was like, all right, cool. I can deal with that. And I looked at, back on things and I started, instead of being uh, thinking about what I didn't have, I started really rejoicing on, reflecting, and realizing all the things that he had already done for me. Then we go into 2009. I mean, like a lot of people, you know, the housing market crashed. My daughter, who was a teenager at that point, rebelled against me. She didn't want anything to do with me. And so I was just feeling frustrated. And I remember I was at Central, I was at a service, and uh, they asked us if we wanted to go up front and, you know, be prayed upon. And man, I can still remember to this day. Whew. Man, Mike's prayers were exacting. I mean, ridiculously exacting. I'm talking about when you think about it, the, the words, it was like, I just couldn't believe he knew my heart to that degree, but I knew that it was God speaking through Mike. And, but you know what the magic of it was, the, the miracle, is that Mike already knew our God. He knew the God of miracles, and he knew that all we had to do was ask him, lean into him and ask him. And that's what he did for me and my daughter. And so that day changed my life. It was then the light switch happened. We sold our home, we did a 180, I met my wonderful wife at church. Beyond that though, most importantly, we began tithing. Once I aligned myself and my heart with my Heavenly Father, everything just started getting into place. And you know, at Central, we have a saying that it's okay to be not be okay. And I'm just so grateful that, 
you know, I could be a part of a church that it's okay to not be okay. Cause I'll tell you, I'm still a work in progress, man. I mean, it's, I'm a work in progress, but it's all right. And you know, Central is just a place where they love on you and they open up their arms without judgment and they just let people in. Without Central, my eternity would be lost and the eternity of loved ones that I helped lead to Christ would be lost as well. So I owe Central everything. That's my, st my story. I love Eugene and what God's done in his life. He's a dear friend, one of the greatest Christ followers you'll meet at Central. You know, we pray for every one of you that you'll experience Jesus just like that. You know, we came out of a series called Making Change, and I don't know if you got a chance to experience that series. If you haven't, I'm gonna encourage you to go online and check it out. But it was probably the greatest series I've ever heard in all of my years of following Jesus around the topic of generosity. It was amazing by our pastor Judd and how God laid that on his heart and what God's done in his own life. You know, I can't think of a single transformative thing in my life that has transformed me deep and rich than the area of generosity. When God got a hold of my heart and he told me that he created me to give my time, my talent, and my financial resources to expand his work in this world and impact people. It's changed my life forever. And every year that I followed Christ, I pray that God will increase my generosity. And this year is no different. My wife Lisa and I, we plan to be the greatest year in the area of generosity in our life. I love our staff because all of our staff are into generosity. Our board has made a commitment in generosity. And if you were a part of these four weeks, what our pastor Judd challenged us to pray about is to take the generosity challenge. Now, what's the generosity challenge? The generosity challenge is just stepping in and allowing God to speak to you. Listen, that's the most important part. See, man can talk you into anything, but God, if he talks you into it, no one can talk you out of it. So the biggest challenge is for you to begin to pray about what God would have you to do. And just listen. God, would you have me do more in the area of generosity? Do you want me to give more of my time, more talent, more of my financial resources? And whatever God tells you, here's the challenge. Say yes. Say yes. And when you say yes, here's the guarantee. If you don't have more joy, if you don't have more of Jesus in your life, if you don't experience more of God, then at the end of 90 days, we'll just give you all the money that you gave back. No questions asked. But we believe in that challenge so much that we just know God's gonna do something deep in your life. So when I was a kid, we would do this challenge called double dog dare you. I don't know if you ever heard that statement. But so I spiritually want a double dog dare you, Central, okay? Double dog dare you to step in and take the challenge. It's easy to do. You can go to central.family. You can go to centralchurch.online. You can find a generosity team member in the lobby. But when you take that challenge, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go out and tell our team, I'm in. I took that challenge. We have a generosity coin we want to give to you to mark this moment along with a T-shirt just to celebrate with you that you're trusting God on a level maybe you've never done before. And in all my 35 plus years of leaning into this area of my life, here's what I want you to know. You could never outgive God, not a single moment of your life. God's gonna show up in powerful, rich ways. I promise you, he's gonna transform you like you've never experienced before. So double dog dare you. Let's go to God in prayer. Well, Jesus, we know you're here. You promised in your word where two or three are gathered in your name. You're in our midst. So we welcome you and recognize you into our life this weekend. We lean into you. We acknowledge your power and your greatness, your ability to do all things. And Father, right now I pray for all of us that we would lay aside anything that's distracting us or keeping us from recognizing you fully in our hearts and lives this weekend. To lay them down. Whether it's a personal battle or a challenge that we're experiencing or hurt or a habit, 
that we'd set those things aside and we would just say, Jesus, we're yours, all of us, all of our hearts, all of our minds, all of our souls, they're yours. In exchange, I pray that we would experience your riches, your goodness, your mercy, your infinite love, and that you would flood our hearts as we worship you. And Jesus will give you all the praise and all the honor and all the credit when you do. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. garden full of broken branches full of painful circumstances can you heal me from this damage cause you make beauty out of ashes I tried my best to find the end Went through hell but wanted heaven And though I don't deserve forgiveness You give more than second chances Come on every voice, sing this out Don't lose hope Don't
Can we all sing that together one more time? It's so tall. Chapter 15 in the Bible, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. And for those who remain in me and I and them, they will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. And he goes on to say, if you remain in me and my words in you, you can ask whatever you wish and it will be received by our Father in heaven. Maybe you're here today and you're holding on to something and you're hoping for something to happen in your life. I just wanna say a simple prayer over your life. Whatever you're faced with, if I can just pray for you today, even if you're watching online or inside one of the prison locations, if I can just say a simple prayer over your life, would you just boldly slip your hand up in the air? Hands going up all over the room. And if you're next to somebody with their hand raised, I wanna encourage you to stretch a hand out towards them. Let's just pray. Let's ask God to do the impossible in their lives today. Would you join me? God, right now we lift up our friends, for those who are brokenhearted, for those who need help today, for those who maybe feel cut off, Lord, I just pray that today we would just get reconnected, reestablished with you, Father, and get in alignment with what your word has for our lives. God, right now we just lift up our burdens and our pain to you, and I pray, Lord, that ultimately you would see this through, that you would just do what only you can do, for it's in your name we pray, and everybody said together. Amen. Let's all sing this together. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name.
we celebrate the change lives today. Central family, I also wanna say a huge thank you for those of you who showed up Wednesday night for Central Live Night. It was the best night ever. 87 people got baptized that night. Pretty amazing. You can be seated. We're gonna throw it over to our online hosts. Hey, what an awesome time of worship that was. So we wanna give a huge shout out to a couple people. First of all, if you are joining us at one of our physical locations, we are so excited that you're here, especially you guys out there at Sunrise Mountain. We see you guys and we love you. Yeah, and to the men and women joining us inside prison yes. facilities, it never gets old yeah. that you are a part of the Central family Absolutely. through our partnership with God Behind Bars. Now, Stacy, we're kicking off a brand new series this yeah. weekend called Love Your Neighbor. Mm -hmm. It's a good one today. Oh, so awesome. let's welcome up our senior pastor, Pastor Judd, as he kicks off this series. All right. Good to see you guys today. Thank you so much for being here with us. I wonder how many of you get annoyed at certain things that you experience in life. I was thinking about the things that annoy me. It's a long list. Have you ever, you ever done like, like there are a lot of things, but, but the top of my list is traffic. Like, like, you know, cones and construction and delays. How many of you get annoyed at traffic? It just, this drives me crazy. And then, you know, like, like sometimes you just think it's construction and then you get up there and there was actually a wreck and then you feel guilty for all the things you thought and said in your heart and you're like, you know, I hope they're okay, you know, God bless them and get out of my way, people. You know, like move your wreck over to the side. Um, or like an automated phone system that you have to be on, on hold with for a long time. That's super annoying, right? Just drives you crazy. Somebody said you can tell a person's personality by how they say the words, speak to a representative to an automated phone system. <laughs> Or when you're talking to a friend or a spouse or somebody and you go on and on and you tell this whole story and then at the end, they, you, you look at them and you're waiting for them to say something and they look up from their phone and they're like, what? <laughs> it's annoying. A lot of things annoy us, bother us, frustrate us. And I think sometimes, you know, it, it's situations and lots of times it's people. People at work can annoy you. People that you encounter that are rude or mean, they, they can annoy you. They can start to drive you crazy. People you're sitting next to right now can, can start to make you lose your mind. Like, it's just, it's part of life. But I think sometimes we can, we can move from annoyance to like more significant frustration. And then we can move to like criticism and even cynicism. And then our heart can start getting hard. And we just stop having compassion for other people and other situations. We just start to see people as the problem. And if they would just get out of my way or take my phone call or listen when I'm talking to them, we wouldn't have this problem. But I wanna suggest to you today that while people can be the problem, people are also your purpose. And that if we want to experience all that God has for us in our lives, if we want to live the best lives, if we want meaning and joy and significance in our life, that's going to come not from having more or making more or having nicer things or driving better cars. That's going to come from loving well. From loving well. In fact, to love well is to live well. To love well is to live well. And Jesus is going to break this down for us. And he does it in this amazing story in Luke chapter 10 that's famous. It's called the story of the Good Samaritan. But I want to look at it with you again, maybe with some fresh eyes. The story of the Good Samaritan actually hinges in Luke chapter 10 on a conversation that Jesus has with um, a religious leader, a religious expert. So check this out. Luke chapter 10. Let's bring it up on the screens here. When we get to the red words, say them real loud here with me. It's just how we make sure everybody's awake. But here, here's what it says. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit what? <laughs> Eternal life. So this is kind of an amazing question. Now, he says, teacher, what should, now, first of all, he's religious, he's an expert in religious law, and he's trying to test Jesus, not the best setup, right, to a question. But then notice he says, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Now that phrase, eternal life, it's actually a Greek word, it's one word, it's not two, it's one word, it's just the word zoe, which literally just means life. 
But it's translated eternal life because it's not, there's three Greek words for life. And this particular word used for life isn't just existing. It isn't just surviving. Zoe is about a quality of life. It's about an abundance in life. In other words, it's not just surviving, it's thriving. Right? It's not just getting by. You know, it's, it's loving the life that you have. It's a meaningful, rich, spiritual, overflowing life that not only changes my life today, but goes forward into the future. So this guy's actually asking Jesus, hey, what is what we might call the good life? You know, I saw this magazine ad recently, and this guy had like a $40,000 watch, and it said the good life. That's not really Jesus' definition of the good life. That's our cultural definition, but everybody wants the good life. We pray for a good life, however we define it. That's why you date people. That's why you go on dating apps. That's why you marry people. That's why you have kids. That's why you get a house. That's why you take jobs. That's why you move. Like, we're all trying to have a rich, meaningful, significant life, right? And that's what this religious leader is kind of asking Jesus, like, how do I get Zoe? Another Greek word for life would be bios. We get our word biology from that, right? Like another word would be psyche. Um, and so he's not asking about just kind of basic life, surviving, going through the motions. How do I get this rich, meaningful, abundant life? And I think that's a question we all understand. And then Jesus turns the question back to him. Jesus often does this. He says, well, what do you think? How do you think you get this kind of life? You know, how would you answer that question? Which, by the way, like, like, this is a cool thing for Jesus to do. I've tried to do this in my marriage, and it doesn't really work. It doesn't work well at home. But anyway, Jesus, man, he, he's the master of this, especially when people are trying to trick him. He's like, what, what, do, you, what do you think? He turns it right back on them. And uh, this guy says, well, what I think is you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul, love your neighbor as yourself which is amazing. That's what Jesus himself said is the greatest commandment. In fact, maybe he even heard Jesus say it, and maybe he's actually quoting Jesus back to himself, like the great student who listens to the teacher and then says back to the teacher exactly what they already said. How can that be wrong? And Jesus says, you're right. That's a great answer. He says, go and do this, love God and love your neighbor, and you will have Zoe, this overflowing, eternal, rich, meaningful life. And so I think for us in our lives, it's a great reminder that if we want more meaning and significance and purpose in our life, it's not just having more, but it's loving well that will give that to us. And if we're going to love well, Jesus is going to challenge us to remember a couple things. One is to love well, we have to cultivate compassion. We have to cultivate compassion. Compassion can be hard to maintain in your heart and in your life. Like, there's a group that needs compassion this coming week, and that's 49er fans. 49er fans need compassion because not only are all the Chiefs fans rooting against them, but now all the Swifties, all the Taylor Swift fans are also rooting against them. I saw this on uh, social media. It says, uh, world's biggest fan of Taylor Swift's boyfriend's team. They don't even know the name of the team. Like, hey, who cares who the team is? It's Taylor Swift's boyfriend's team. So 49ers fans, good luck. You need compassion. But Jesus is, is talking to this guy and, and he gives this right answer. Amazing, love God and love others and that's awesome. And then, then the guy asks one more question and this is what he says. His next question is this, uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 29. The man wanted to justify his actions. So he's already like, well, I love God, love your neighbor. That was right. But now he's like, I want to justify my actions. So he asked Jesus, and what? Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? In other words, you know what he's, you know what he's saying? He's saying, hey, well, Jesus, this is what's going on behind the scenes. Jesus, who is it okay to not love? Right, like, like, who is my neighbor? By the way, um, it makes me think of Mr. Rogers, you know, like, you know, welcome to this. I wore my Mr. Rogers sweater, can you see? Anybody, can you see? I know some of you already thought, what a nerd. Our pastor's such a nerd. He's, he looks like Mr. Rogers. I did that on purpose. But only because I've worn this before and somebody told me, you look like Mr. Rogers. I'm like, okay, well, so this is my Mr. Rogers outfit. Anyway, won't you be my neighbor? He says, who is my neighbor? And he's, he's trying to find out where the limits are, right? Like, like is, it, is it 
Democrats, are they my neighbor? Or does it have to be Republicans? Or Republicans, does it have to be Democrats? Is it, you know, like, is, is, are, you know, is it 49ers fans and Chiefs fans? Is it people no matter their race background? Is it, is it my tribe or other tribes? Is it people that, that believe different things than I do? Like, like, where's the boundary? Like, yeah, I'm willing to love God and love my neighbor, but like, who can I not love? And so Jesus doesn't really answer that question. He's really good at that. Jesus tells a story. And he says, there was a man, it's the story of the Good Samaritan. There was a man who was traveling the 17 mile trek from Jerusalem downward, leaving the city on these windy roads. And as he's traveling, he gets mugged, beaten, and left for dead on the side of the road. And then a little while later, a priest comes walking by, a religious person, and they see this man laying on the side of the road, and the priest goes to the other side of the road and walks around him. And then a Levite comes by, a religious worker, and he too sees the guy laying on the side of the road, and he walks around him and keeps going. And around this time, they're thinking like, surely somebody's gonna be the hero, and probably the hero's gonna be an amazing Israelite Jewish person, preferably a man who's gonna come along, he's gonna see the guy by the side of the road, and he's gonna rescue him, and that guy will be the hero of Jesus' story. And instead, Jesus puts a spin on it that would have been shocking to his original hearers. Here's what he says, Luke chapter 10, look at this, verse 33, it says, then a, don't, don't miss this word, a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt what? Compassion for him, a despised Samaritan. So Jews and Samaritans hated each other. They were neighbors, but it was a racial conflict. It was a theological conflict. So the Jews felt like the Samaritans were half-blooded. They weren't full-blooded Jews. So there's all this racial hatred and dynamic. And not only that, the Samaritans believed you worshiped at a different place than the Jews did. So there was theological differences. So they're outside of God. They're not our people. They are not us, right? And it's the outsider that Jesus makes the hero of the story. I mean, the insider, the priest, the religious guy, they should have helped the guy by the side of the road, but it was an outsider who comes by and has compassion. Not only that, he takes the guy, bandages his wounds, puts him on a donkey, takes him to an inn, pays the innkeeper for two months stay for the guy so that he can recover. He has to go on and take care of his business dealings, but he says, hey, when I come back through, obviously it was a trade route for him, when I come back through, um, if there's leftovers, I'll make it up for you, whatever is additional to get this guy on his feet. And so Jesus basically is telling us like, like, who is my neighbor is the wrong question. The better question is, how can I be a neighbor in this moment? The priest wasn't the neighbor. The Levite, religious worker, wasn't the neighbor. But it was the Samaritan. And what's so shocking about that is to Jesus' original audience, y'all, there was no such thing as a good Samaritan. <laughs> we tell this story like the good Samaritan. They would have been like, oh, no. And Jesus even says, a despised Samaritan walks by. And the guy you hate becomes the guy who helps. So who's the neighbor? Powerful story. Now I have compassion for the religious leaders. Maybe because I am one. <laughs> and I think it's easy to just pick on them in the story, right? Like they just walked by the dead guy, or the guy left for dead on the side of the road. Some people have said, well, maybe they did that because they're priests and Levite and they want to if you touch a dead body, if they didn't know if the guy was alive or dead, if you touch a dead body, that would make you ceremonially unclean. You have to go through all these hoops to be clean again, and so it might throw off your work at the temple, which is an argument, right? Except Jesus is clear in his story that they're coming down from Jerusalem. So they're not headed to the temple. They're not going to work, y'all. They just got off work. They're going home or wherever. They're headed out, and they obviously should have helped the man and they walked around him. But maybe they had what I might call compassion fatigue. I don't know if you've ever, you just don't care anymore. You're just so tired. And let me tell you something, as a pastor for 30 years, 30 plus years, sometimes the people you help the most, the cliche is true, sometimes the people you help the most hurt you the most. And sometimes you help hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, and then you feel like you get stabbed in the back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Even if you don't, you feel like that. 
And sometimes it can be hard to keep caring. Sometimes you get worn out and exhausted. And I just wonder, maybe the priest walked by and he saw this guy and he thought, I should care, but I don't. I'm exhausted. That looks like drama. The guy might be dead already. I got other issues I got to deal with. I've done that a hundred times before and it didn't go well. Maybe. Compassion fatigue is a real thing. It's easy to to lose our care. In fact, if you're from the South, you will have heard this. Like Lori's aunt used to say, you know, and you, you say that this phrase like, I don't give a hoot anymore. She would say this, like, my give a hooter is broken. I just don't care. You ever, you ever, I've been there. I've been there as a pastor. You're tired, you're worn out, you're exhausted, and you know you should care, but that doesn't change the fact that you don't, right? because you're just at the end of yourself. You're tired. And so here's a couple of things that I try to do in my own life to cultivate compassion. Because when I look at these religious leaders, I realize that has been me in different scenarios over the years, and it could be me again. And the way to avoid that is to cultivate the very thing that we see marks out the difference between the religious leaders and the Samaritan. And it's one word, compassion. When the Samaritan saw the man, he had compassion for him. But to have compassion, you have to have a capacity for compassion. You actually cultivate that capacity in your spiritual life. Here's a few things that I try to do in my own life just to maintain some semblance of compassion for other people. And this is my little give a hooter meter right here, my give a hoot meter. See, it's in the red zone. This is my... I don't give a care right now. And so what do I do? Some of you are here today and you're like, yeah, I should care about that. I just don't. What do you do? First, I got to manage my margin. If you're so strapped and overcommitted and you have, you're exhausted and you're running a million directions at once, if you don't have any margin in your life, then you're going to be so stressed out and frazzled, right? That, that, that you're not going to have anything left. So much compassion actually happens in the margin in our lives. We have to have some built-in compassion. This is why in the Bible, I think, the idea of a day of rest is so important. The idea of the Sabbath is so key, like trying to rest, trying to recuperate. You've got to manage the margin. A lot of you have a start doing list. Maybe you should think about a stop doing list as well. Right? Manage your margin so that you have the room to be compassionate. And that just helps my meter go up a little bit. Another thing I try to do is edit, edit your inputs. Edit my inputs. If all you do is watch the news and you're just constantly exposed to negativity and bias and fear mongering and all of that, you're not going to have a lot of emotional bandwidth left to be compassionate to people. If all you do is just live in your social media feed, the danger with social media is it's often just the people in our tribe, in our stream, our, you know, our inside group that we hear. And often they're railing against those other people on the outside, the outside group, the outsiders, the other people. And all that's going to do is drain your emotional energy if you don't offset it with other inputs. So what are those inputs in our lives? Well, church is a good one. Well done. Leaning into God's word is a good one. And by the way, if you don't have a devotional practice in your life, let me tell you a simple, easy devotional practice that will take you three minutes a day but I think can make a difference over time. And that is go to, on your Android device or your Apple device, just go to Bible, the Bible app, B-I-B-L-E, the Bible app. Looks like a little Bible. Download that app. And you'll see at the bottom, it's, it'll say verse of the day. It's just a verse. Often they'll have a little one to two minute video that goes along with the verse. Different pastors do it. I'm doing it, I think, this Wednesday. Different pastors and leaders around the world do it. Verse of the day, okay. And then the scripture and even a few meditative moments like, like literally in three minutes every day, all you got to do is open the app and it's all right there for you. And you're like, oh, that's good. What will happen is you're editing your inputs. You're making sure to offset all of the negativity and drama and fear mongering and everything else going on in our world with God and his goodness and his word. And that will help your compassion meter, your care meter go up a little bit. Third thing I try to do is remember all that God has done in my life. I try to consistently remember how good God has been to me and how God rescued me. Listen, when God found me, I was a mess. When God found some of you, you were a mess. Look, you were an outsider. Some of you, like me, you were annoying, right? 
But God loved you even when you were foolish. And God loved you even when you were selfish. And God loved you even when you were wrong. He loved you when you were cheating. He loved you when you were stealing. He loved you when you were bitter. He loved you when you didn't, you didn't do the thing you said you'd do. And he loved you when you did the thing you said you wouldn't do. Right, God, God loved you when you were lazy and he loved you when you were crazy and he loved you when you acted out and when you burned out and when you wouldn't listen. He loved you when you were stubborn, when you walked away, when you were self-righteous. He loved you when you were at your utter worst. God did not cancel you even though you deserved it. He showed you compassion. He showed me compassion, right? And so one of the things that helps me regain that sense of compassion so that I don't walk past an opportunity to show mercy is I have to keep reminding myself all God did for me. People are messy, but we're all messy. I'm messy. People will drive you crazy. Sometimes I drive myself crazy, <laughs> right? People, you can tell them again and again and again to do something and they don't do it and they come back in the same situation like it's shocking. But I did the same thing for years before God finally hit me over the head hard enough with a two by four, the only way I receive, you know what I mean? He finally got through to me to make a change in my life. I gotta remember what God has done in my life and that positions me to show grace to others. So. If you want to love well, to live well, first, keep cultivating compassion. Watch your margins. Be intentional about the inputs you let into your life. And then remember all that God has done in your life. Then here's the second thought, and that is just do mercy. Do mercy in your life. So in Jesus' story in Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 36, he kind of lays this out. Let's bring this, let's bring his story up. He says to this guy, he's told the story of the three people. He says, now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. And the man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Now, I never saw this before. Check this out. This was like, oh, wow. This guy, the religious expert, can't even bring himself to say the word Samaritan. You see that? He doesn't say the Samaritan who showed him mercy. He says the one he can't even say his name, who he is, the one who showed him mercy. And then Jesus said, yes, now go and what? Do the same. Go and do the same. Go and show mercy. And show him, look, we don't show mercy and cultivate compassion to earn our salvation. That's a gift from God. It's something God gives us through our faith in Jesus Christ. You simply receive that. But if you want to get the full benefit of that abundant life flowing in your life, that comes when you begin to love well God and others as you walk through your daily life. It'll lower your stress level. It'll give you more meaning and purpose. And it'll remind you of the things that matter most. I learned this most powerfully when I was uh, in my very first kind of ministry situation. And um, I, I went to this, I was uh, my supervisor, I was an intern at this church. And he said, Hey, I want you to go to a nursing home. I want you to sit down and meet with like an elderly individual and just go in for an hour a day uh, each week. It's part of your assignment. It was a summer thing. And, um, you know, I just want you to listen, talk to them, learn, pray for them. They may not have anybody to talk to. I said, okay, called a nursing home, said, Hey, I want to volunteer. I went down and I said, listen, I just, you know, anybody that doesn't have People come visit them. They don't have family. They're just kind of alone. I, I, you know, I'd love to be there for them. Just go listen. And so this lady said, well, I, I have somebody I'd really like for you to see. And she, she took me down this hallway. I remember it felt like a long hall to the last room in the hallway. And we walk in this room and she said, this lady was transferred here. She doesn't have any friends or family that we know of. There's no connection that we see. Nobody comes, nobody visits her. She's in here alone all the time. She's probably in her 20s at this point. She was in a terrible car wreck years ago, a uh, disastrous car wreck. And her body's all mangled, her, her hands all mangled. Her face is... is um, severely damaged and she's alive but the nurse tells me we don't know that she can hear or she can't communicate back in any way that we've seen so I was like well this isn't really what I signed up for you know like I just wanted to come talk to an elderly person and like try to be encouraging what is this I remember she like she goes you know so what am I supposed to do she goes just just talk to her and then she shut the door and walked out. And I'm like, oh, 
hello? Of course, nothing. Uh, what's up? I didn't know what to do, so I would visit this lady every week. And I would go in, and for the first several weeks, I just brought a book. And I would read a book out loud, you know, for about an hour. It took me a couple of weeks, but I'd go in, and, and I'd read to her out loud. And I started to get more comfortable just being around her. And, and I would reach up and grab her, her gnarled, deformed hand. And I would hold it. I'd just hold her hand and read to her. And after three or four weeks of doing this, what I remember is I was walking into her room and one of the staff had said something to me and I made a comment to them and she heard my voice coming into her room and for the, she had had no response that anybody had seen. She began to like flail in her bed and she would make this odd, joyous sound. It was like she knew that voice, they're coming to see me. And I would hold her hand and read to her for an hour. And the next week, I'd come around the corner and as soon as she heard my voice, she would flail around. And I'll never forget that experience because I realized that's what compassion can do. It can bring somebody back to life. That's what mercy can do. And then I thought about those experiences I had with her they marked me for the rest of my life. One of the most powerful experiences I had in my entire life. I would tell you that I benefited more from that than she did. Because that's also how mercy works. In fact, Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. When you show compassion and mercy to others, it boomerangs back to you in your own life. That's why he says it's better to give than receive, which isn't just about money. It's also about mercy right? You give it and you tend to receive it. And mercy is something we can all do in big and small ways. Listen, when you choose to overlook an offense instead of reacting or attacking, that's mercy. When you choose to believe the best about somebody, when you could easily believe the worst, you know what I'm talking about, that's, that's mercy. When you set a boundary rather than try to get revenge or you hold out forgiveness rather than trying to keep a grudge, that's mercy. When you choose to serve rather than be served, when you choose to give even when it feels like it's not enough, when you choose to take a call rather than just send it to voicemail, come on somebody, you know, anybody know that mama? You look at your phone, you're like, oh, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, help me. Because if I take this call, it could be an hour, right? You know what I'm talking about? It's going to be an extra grace required call. Sometimes it's okay to decline, but when you accept, it's mercy, right? When you meet a friend for coffee, even though you disagree, mercy. When you Invest in a friendship with somebody who doesn't look like you or think like you. It's mercy. When you refuse to argue with family members who have different opinions because you value the relationship over politics, mercy, right? Look, when you do the dishes, even when it's not your turn, <laughs> mercy. You change a friend's tire, it's mercy. You, you uh, encourage somebody in the midst of a struggle. You offer to check in on a neighbor's dog. <laughs> you be willing to pick up a shift of a coworker who's having a hard time. Listen, you pray for the success of others while you wait for your own. All of that is mercy. It doesn't take big acts to make a big impact. Sometimes the small acts of mercy can make the greatest impact. And I know it's easy to sit back and feel overwhelmed. And we all think, look, I can't help everybody. I can't help everybody I see on the side of the road. I can't help everybody who's hurting. I can't. And you're right. We can't. We can't help everybody. Sometimes we can't even help ourselves. Sometimes we can't even help our own family right in front of us, right? But just because I can't help everybody, that doesn't mean I can't help somebody. So just by being merciful and cultivating that compassion and being willing as God leads me to do the little I can do, it's going to not only impact their life, it's going to give me that zoe, that rich, meaningful, abundant life that we all long for. Kindness doesn't have to be big to have a big effect. So who was the neighbor to the man? 
He was the one who was merciful, even though he was a Samaritan and an outsider. Jesus says, go and do likewise. I mean, there's a lot of ways we could help you do that. You don't have to do these things in the church to show mercy and compassion. But if you want, we have hundreds of ministries. You could sign up for an hour a month, one hour a quarter, you know, whatever you want to do. But there's so many things going on. We have people that volunteer literally 24 hours a day, take different time slots from their own home, and they're part of our 24-hour church community. Last year, we we literally received 61,000 phone calls through 21-hour church. Every one of them marked, follow up, prayed for, followed through on, and volunteers and ministry leaders who were trained did that. I've had people come to me and say, I called the 24-hour church line a couple years ago, and literally it saved my life. And they're not joking. Like it saved their life. Just a voice on the other end. Not a voice with all the answers. It's a voice of compassion, voice of mercy. Somebody to pray with them and tell them, hey, I've been there. You're not alone. You're loved. We care. Our amazing food work. When I think about, like, I don't know how to help all the unhoused population in our city. I don't know how to, how to help everybody who's struggling, who I see by the side of the road. But what I can do is give through our church to help an amazing ministry that is helping those people in a way that's controlled and organized and really making a difference in their lives. And hope for the city is that kind of ministry. So I can't do everything, but when you give to the church or you give to hope for the city, you're doing something. It's mercy. It counts in a significant way. Maybe you love students or youth or, you know, you just love to serve others or help. Maybe you have a teaching gift or you love to organize communities. Listen, you can always just go to our app or go to central.family and there's a link you'll see. It says volunteer with us. Just click that. And you're in the driver's seat. You can decide how much or how little you have time to do, what you're able to do. But listen, anything you do do, that's mercy. That's mercy. You can also see any of our team members after our experience today. Just let them know you'd like to do something to help. And they'll try to find the right place for you. We'll try to get you in that position and get you in a place where you feel like, man, I'm giving back and I'm experiencing mercy and I'm showing mercy. It's making a difference in my life. But if you want to live well, love well, cultivate compassion, do mercy. This is the path to Zoe, to abundant, overflowing life. Maybe you're here today and maybe you've never crossed that line of faith in your life. The amazing thing is the Good Samaritan was an outsider who Luke and Jesus raise up in his story as a hero. God loves to take outsiders and make them insiders. God loves to take nobodies and make them somebodies. He loves to take those who feel unloved and let them know they're loved. He loves to take people who are broken and hurting and give them hope and a purpose. He loves to take that which maybe the world or the culture says is not and you know, ultimately show that his power and glory can move in you and through you. And it's simply through an act of faith you receive his forgiveness. In fact, Jesus was literally crucified for our sins, died on the cross. And when you think about it, he was crucified outside the city so that we could become insiders by the grace of God. He was crucified on the outside so that we could step in and know God and know his love and know his forgiveness. And I'd love to give some of you that opportunity. You know if God's been tapping you on the shoulder. You know if he's been calling you to come home to him. And today can be the moment you cross that line of faith and you enter into a whole new experience of abundant life as you follow him. So would all of you bow your heads and close your eyes. And if you'd like to become a follower of Jesus, you can begin by repeating this prayer after me. Just say, dear God, I thank Thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again. Forgive me for my sins. Give me the gift of eternal life. Help me face the challenges I'm up against. God, I surrender my life to you. In Christ's name. Friends, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's your prayer today, I want to ask you to just slip your hand in the air. Just make eye contact with me, just to say before God, to say to me, you're going to trust him and follow him in your life today. Let's reach out to him today. God bless you guys. Thank you.
Thank you, guys. Hands are going up around the room. Thank you. Trust him in your life. Thank you. God, I thank you for each person just reaching out to you, trusting you today. I pray you'll bless, forgive, restore, heal. May we all grow to love well. May we live well. And may we know your power and presence in our life each day as we do it. We thank you for each of these individuals. We lift them to you in Christ's name. Amen.